Aldous Huxley once said, After silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. And that sure feels right to me. We all have a personal relationship with music, don't we? It's a universal language, one of the most distinctly human things imaginable. The dialect in which that language is spoken can vary wildly. Whether you connect with indie rock, death metal, or avant-garde piano music, the truth is that there is some kind of music you relate to and are free to enjoy. However, for those who make the music, it is not always so simple. My name is Josh, and this is Obscure History. The memories that I have of my childhood are foggy. I'm sure that's true of many people. Perhaps it's because it was largely unremarkable. Or maybe my brain is just configured in a way that inhibits long-term memory. Who's to say, really? It could be anything. When I turn the lens of my mind backward to try and find a moment from those early years, I can only see the silhouettes. And can I even prove that those silhouettes are in accurate shapes? Likely, no. Memory is a difficult thing to understand, but like music, it is universally human. Not many of those silhouettes are in the shape of my dad, because relationships are hard and things don't always turn out the way that people plan, but I do see him in flashes. I remember a homemade Terminator mask that was far too realistic, a tattoo shop that I was weirdly proud of as a kid, a sip of bitter beer to quell my curiosity about the bottles in the fridge, A remote-controlled car in the parking lot of an apartment complex, a burnt stromboli, rays of eastern Oregon sunset breaking over a slot car track, and a living room wrestling match. Those memories, though, are like shadows dancing on the wall. They're nearly visible, and just as I think I can see their shape, I feel the pang of uncertainty and they dissipate, return to the ether. There's one memory, though, that I can see with full clarity— and it might be one of the most important memories that I have, whether it's fully accurate or not. In this memory, I'm in a bright red Pontiac Grand Am. It's unmuffled and about 10 decibels too loud in every way. My eyes are below the dashboard looking up through the windows. It's a late spring or early summer day. The tops of the trees are green and the car smells like hot leather, something I still detest to this day. We pass the farm supply store and the fire department, but as these familiar landmarks disappear into the rear view, my ears suddenly begin to notice something. This music that the car is blasting is hypnotizing. Metallica. But specifically, my little ears kept hearing a recurring sound, repeating in a pattern. In this memory, I ask my dad, what is that sound that sounds like people clapping? And after some brief explanation, he replied, that's the snare drum. And from that moment, my fate was sealed. I'm not sure how it all came together, but I began taking drum lessons from a guy who was playing in a local 90s soft rock band in our area. We only really covered the basics, and I didn't even have a drum set to practice on, but apparently I was enthusiastic enough that for Christmas, when I was seven years old, I received a brilliant blue five-piece drum set. Somewhere deep in the archives, there is a photo of me holding my new drumsticks behind my new drum set, and I'm wearing this weird bucket hat because it was the 90s. I remember feeling burdened by that picture, like I was so excited to have a drum set that I couldn't even be bothered to smile for a photo. And that was that. For the next decade, my neighbors would hate me, especially as my taste in music evolved. I had some great teachers partner with me through the years, and to this day I still practice as often as possible. It's difficult now, though, as an adult who isn't pursuing music as a career or anything, but there is a certain familiarity that I feel when I sit down and play for even just a couple minutes. I know it's cliche, but as an only child who was a bit dramatic and emotional, 
Those drums were a much-needed outlet. I had a practice ritual. By the time I was in middle school, I would come home from school, turn on PBS, and watch Antiques Roadshow and Bob Ross while I played drums for hours on end. It was a secret language that only I and those brilliant blue drums understood, and our conversations reverberated throughout my bedroom and the neighborhood until we were forced by time or other commitments to call it quits for the day. And when I wasn't drumming, I was studying drums. I would browse the iTunes store for hours, just going down the list of each genre, listening to new and strange music. The Christian radio station that played horrible Christian contemporary music during the day played hardcore and punk after 8pm, and I remember finally tuning my stereo to that station and just waiting for 8 o'clock to come every evening. I remember in 7th grade when my girlfriend burnt me a copy of Hawthorne Heights' A Silence in Black and White, and the feeling of excitement of loading it onto my computer for the first time was just exhilarating. Music consumed me to a fault, honestly. I focused so much energy on music that I never really succeeded in school. There just wasn't enough time for both, and I saw my future in music, not college. Joke's on me, though. I went to college, and nobody has ever paid me to drum for them. Perhaps you're wondering why I have invested so much of this episode waxing poetic about my love of the drums. I recently had this revelation when studying some early jazz musicians. The barrier to entry for me was almost non-existent. I mean, drums are very expensive, so that was a factor for my parents, but after they got that settled, there really wasn't anything holding me back. There were no societal standards that discouraged me from pursuing my dreams, Sound ordinance laws protected my right to play for as long as possible, or until dark, or 8pm, or whatever it was. And technology allowed me nearly unfiltered access to any kind of music imaginable. This is notable because there's a very interesting phenomenon in the world of percussion. It's no secret that the music industry is dominated by men, but this is especially true of drums and percussion as an instrument specifically. Some estimates suggest that as few as 17% of collegiate-level percussionists are female. I've always been completely baffled by this. Why is there such a barrier to entry for women in percussion? There's been a pretty significant amount of scholarship dedicated to answering this very question. One possible reason for the extremely wide gender gap in percussionists is because of the reinforcement of gender roles in youth. There are few things as aggressive as taking a stick and smacking it into a thing to make a deafeningly loud noise. Generally speaking, in our society, aggression is dismissed when observed in boys and is condemned when observed in girls. The reinforcement of this cultural ideal might be enough to convince some young ladies that drumming is something that is for the boys, and would therefore contribute to that gender gap. Another factor lies in how we've dealt with femininity historically. In the early days of the music industry, few women were able to break into the mainstream, and the ones that did had to maintain an angelic visage. They were expected to be porcelain dolls trained to do complicated tricks. The first instrument to be widely acceptable as a woman's instrument was the piano, because it can be played with a jolly face and a prim posture. Then came the flute, because it resulted in minimal facial distortion and the flautist's posture seemed naturally feminine anyways. Slowly, the other instruments began to trickle in and become culturally available to women, but for some reason percussion never really caught on. There were some women who were able to break through in the early days of jazz, though, and before we get any farther, we need to pause for about one minute and hear from some sponsors. Born to tavern owners in Wisconsin, Viola Smith was one of ten children. Smith's parents required all of their children to learn piano, but for Viola and the other six girls of her family, music went beyond just a cursory understanding of one instrument. At the behest of their father, the girls started a band called the Schmitz Sisters Family Orchestra. As the youngest girl, Viola got stuck with whatever instrument was left, which, luckily for her, happened to be the drums and she was a natural. Not only did she master reading music and the fundamentals of playing her instrument, but she was as flashy as possible. She really tried to make her drumming a spectacle, and it worked, 
People loved their music. She had drums above her shoulders and would stand to hit those, then sit back down and play the underside of her cymbals. She was an extremely kinetic and dynamic performer, and she did it all with the smile and pristine appearance the society required of her. The sisters traveled around Wisconsin playing for radio shows, at vaudeville performances, and at the movie theaters. After putting in a ton of legwork to make ends meet and promote the band, the girls got their first big break when they appeared on Major Bo's Amateur Hour, which was essentially a radio version of American Idol. In an attempt to capitalize on the newfound momentum, Viola and her sister Mildred broke off and started their own band called the Coquettes. And things really started picking up from there. I'd like you to meet our very charming little drummer, Viola Smith. There are a couple of interesting and important things to note about this point in Viola Smith's career. The first is that the Coquettes got pretty popular and even had a film special made about them. And second, Coquette was 1940s slang for a flirtatious woman. By choosing this moniker, Viola Smith was already challenging the societal expectations of women of her day. It was also reflective of her personal evolution. She said of this time in her life, I was brought up a very strong Catholic, and I remained a good Catholic into my playing years. But after a few years, I got farther and farther away from it. Religion. Same as my sister. She was also a good Catholic. We were still in the orchestra when we both skipped Sunday Masses because we were working Saturday nights. We always had a good excuse, you know. Dear God, we have a good excuse. Unfortunately, for as popular as the Coquettes were, they disbanded after only a couple of years when Mildred got married. However, despite the disappointing breakup, Viola was able to again use the momentum that she had to propel herself even farther. She received a scholarship to Juilliard School of Music, and from there she joined Phil Spittlney's Hour of Charm Orchestra, perhaps the most famous all-girl orchestra in the country at that time and shortly thereafter she joined the NBC Orchestra, one of the most famous orchestras in the history of entertainment media. Viola used her fame to blaze a trail for other female musicians. In an article that she wrote for Downbeat Magazine during World War II, she argued that bands who lost men to the war should fill those vacancies with female musicians, and even named some of her favorites. Viola Smith was such a prolific drummer that she even played at President Harry Truman's inauguration in 1949. She continued her prolific career into the 60s and was even the drummer in the original Broadway production of Cabaret. In fact, Viola Smith continued drumming in bands until she was 100 years old, which is one of the most incredible things I have ever read. Sadly, at the age of 107, Viola Smith passed away on October 21st, 2020. But I think that there's a little bit more here to uncover. Not only did Viola Smith prove to be one of the most prolific drummers in the history of jazz music, she also rubbed elbows with some of the industry's most legendary figures. Smith gave a wonderful interview for the Syncopated Times magazine, and when asked about Gene Krupa, one of the most well-known jazz drummers of all time, she replied with, He was a lovely person, compared with Buddy Rich. Buddy Rich, I couldn't say anything against a dead man, but Buddy, his musicians didn't go for Buddy so much. See, he was hard to deal with. I met him. That's all, I met him. And I'm just saying what I heard from the musicians who were in his band. So he couldn't compare with Gene Krupa, because Gene Krupa was the exact opposite. He was such a fine person. What a shame he died so early in his life. And even further, this woman who was a prolific musician, who was a contemporary to so many well-known legendary drummers, also knew Frank Sinatra. When asked about her favorite male performers, she said, Sinatra! It's been printed quite a bit that I've been out with Sinatra. All the orchestras in New York had their night lunches, where they all wanted ribs. They'd go to a rib place. 
So it turns out I go to this rib place and each table had eight people. So I met Frank Sinatra because he was at the same table as me. So he asked me for a date. I didn't actually go for a date, but I saw him. He was working every night. I was working every night. It was really hard to date, but we would meet. Despite running in the same circle as some of jazz's biggest stars, we don't know Viola Smith. Part of the problem is the way that the media marketed her. She was known as the female Jean Krupa and the fastest girl drummer. You'll notice that her accolades were qualified by her gender in the media. She wasn't Viola Smith. She was the female version of Jean Krupa. She wasn't the fastest drummer. She was the fastest girl drummer. Jazz in its early years was a boys club, a place for men to say and do things that they were too afraid to say or do in front of women in their regular lives. Women who tried to break into the jazz scene faced a wall of resistance from men who wanted to keep status quo, and the ripples of that echo to this day. Rolling Stone put together a list of the top 100 drummers of all time. There were three women on it, and Viola Smith wasn't one of them. If you type best girl drummers on Google, you'll see some lists, but not from the big magazines or the blogs. And if you're particularly astute, you'll even see a suggested search that says, do girls play the drums? This is particularly sad for me because I so fondly recall sitting in my room, dripping with sweat and thrashing my drum heads for hours. I remember the joy of mastering something that seemed so difficult and the pride in showing it off to my friends. I remember letting the drums speak the things that I needed to say but didn't have words for. Society hadn't placed a stigma on me. I had no reason to stay away from the deafening wail of cymbals. I wasn't qualified as good, but I guess good for a boy. I pursued that medium unencumbered. Not everybody is a drummer, and people find the language that their soul speaks in many different places. But it hurts my heart a little to imagine a woman swaying at a concert, eyes locked onto the drummer, wondering what would have happened if she had been able to follow the allure that she felt when she was a girl. All right, guys, that is the end of this one. Thank you so much for listening. To the young ladies out there who are interested in drums but feel like maybe it's not girly or whatever, here is my advice. Grab some sticks, punch a boy, and start smashing some drum heads. <laughs> I'm just kidding, sort of. I cannot advocate for violence, especially senseless violence. But you get the point. If you want to do something, you go and do it, despite whatever society thinks that you should do. All right, guys, as we wrap this one up, um, I do have to send a shout out to Keelan at mentallyamagpie.com. Mentallymagpie.com is a place where you can find podcast reviews, book reviews, and there is more content on the way. Mentallyamagpie.com. Be confident in your curiosity. Maybe you're wondering why I'm sending a shout out over there, and that is actually because Keelan won a fun little Twitter contest that I hosted. I asked Twitter to guess the very obscure province, territory, I guess you could say, not really a country, that my family immigrated from. And after much guessing, uh, we actually got to the bottom of it. Technically, my friend Jordan actually got it, but I don't think that it counts for him to get it because he knew me a long time ago and is a personal friend. So I think that he had too much information and he cheated. <laughs> uh, for those of you that do not follow me on Twitter, you should because sometimes I do fun things like that. But if you're curious, uh, sometime in the very early uh, seven, very late 1700s, early 1800s, my aunt my ancestors immigrated from Alsace-Lorraine, which is this territory which is sometimes kind of autonomous, sometimes German, sometimes French. It just depends on which war you're reading about. <laughs> so that was super fun. Actually, I got like a bunch of people responding. And uh, so yeah, if you want to be involved in some of that fun stuff, um, you can find the show at All the People Pod on Twitter. I know it's the old handle. You can't change it. Um, but you can also find it at Obscure History Podcast on Instagram. If you liked this episode, then share it with your friends. 
uh, maybe post it on your social media or just like, uh, I don't know, proselytize for me, I guess. <laughs> uh, one of the best things you can do is actually to leave a rating and review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts or whatever it is that you're listening to this on. Um, weirdly, that helps a ton. Okay, so normally I play um, an indie music, uh, like an indie musician. Sorry, I forget how to speak here at the end of the episodes. Um, usually I play an indie musician, and I've got a few lined up. I've actually got like the rest of the year lined up, frankly, on a secret spreadsheet. But today I figured that um, to honor the occasion, maybe I would play some drums to take us out. So forgive me, my setup's not ideal. It's not going to be perfect. But I'm going to play a little tune. I'll probably fade it out after just a minute. And uh, yeah, that's how we're going to end today. So I hope you guys have a great week. Currently, if you're listening to this on Monday, I'm actually in the woods fishing, probably. And uh, I'm definitely having a good time. So I hope that you are as well. I'll talk to you guys next week.